Juan Manuel Carrillo is a retired deputy director of California Arts Council and former faculty member of Consumnes River College. He is a founding member of the Royal Chicano Air Force, the RCAF, an artist collective. He is a historian, writer, poet, and visual artist. He was born in Mexico, raised in San Francisco, and has lived in Sacramento for over 50 years. His drawings, prints, and paintings have been exhibited in various galleries and exhibition spaces in solo and group shows with the RCAF. Please give a warm welcome to our guest speaker, Juan. Okay. Devorah, thank you so much. Sue, the same. Uh, thank you both and Melissa for uh, having me, uh, inviting me, and uh, presenting this work. I uh, only realized, uh, perhaps yesterday, that outside of an exhibition in Woodland, no one has ever seen these prints. Uh, so I am so grateful for the State Library uh, to show them to people here, there, and everywhere, wherever you are. I'm uh, I'm so pleased to join all of you in uh, in this presentation. Um, I think um, you should know maybe very quickly before we get into this uh, almost an hour long uh, presentation of the eight prints. It is a uh, it's certainly an outgrowth of my interest in history. Uh, the the days of fighting for uh, ethnic studies and Chicano studies and Raza studies and um, seem distant um, because it was over 50 years ago that um, the battle for ethnic uh, studies uh, began. Um, but that that uh, resulted in my consciousness uh, being altered. And I became very interested in my own heritage, my own history, my family's history, as well as a people's history, uh, which of course is tied into a nation's history, which is part of world history. It uh, All of that fed my interest. And I, when I began to teach, I told students, collect your family's stories. Um, because there'll be a time that those stories will disappear. You will never know them. And that's when you begin to ask questions, when the source is seems to be gone. And so um, I, as many others, began to inquire and seek the histories of our families and our peoples and, in a sense, the nation's stories. And so it, it continues in my life. And this is a project that has roots in all of that. Um, what I'm going to do here is, first of all, you should know that my mother was able to uh, be recorded, her life story. Uh, my sister, uh, Helen, recorded my mother's life story. And from that, I certainly that was uh, the ground from which I could then move into other things. These prints, every one of them has her words from those recordings built into the art piece. Um, and then of course the images are photographs that um, sort of say something about that time, that part of her life. My sister Carmen uh, recorded my mother's words and you'll hear her voice uh, as my mother. Um, as, as our mother's voice. Uh, so when, when you hear that voice, you'll know it's my sister. Each of my siblings have really had a hand in helping to make this happen. B, Helen, Carmen, my brother Nacho, um, and I don't think I'm forgetting somebody. I sometimes do. Um, and then especially my nephew, Julian, who has been at my side helping me to make this more digitally uh, presentable. Uh, and you'll see the impact of his, uh, of his help during the entire uh, story here. I wanted to begin with the what we call the first print. It's called The Beginning. And the beginning, uh, the beginning of my mother's life. Um, 
it's um let's see what else can i tell you about that? i'm going to give each of these prints a silent maybe 10 seconds or so for you to peruse take a look uh see what you see in it don't try to read uh, i don't know how possible that is for anybody don't try to read what's on there uh it, that's up for close-up uh, viewing i suppose but i'll let i'll just be quiet before we begin the presentation Maria del Carmen was born in April 1912 in Cocoyol, Sinaloa, Mexico, located in the foothills of the Sierra Madre Occidental Mountain Range. Her parents were Florencia Salazar Aguirre and Juan Guerrero Camacho. Carmelita grew up in this small rural settlement, a rancho as these settlements were called. It probably consisted of no more than 15 to 20 homes. The government center was the nearby town of San Ignacio. At the time, Mexico was in the second year of its Revolutionary War, which began in 1910. The complex issues fueling the war also affected the political and social climate in Sinaloa. The basic question was, what government would be in control? The government of dictator Porfirio Diaz or the constitutional government led by the rebels? In the state of Sinaloa, much of the military battles took place in the large cities of Mazatlan and Culiacan. San Ignacio and the surrounding region escaped much of the violence, perhaps due to the isolation of the region. It took 15 hours to get there from the populated coast. Nonetheless, the people in San Ignacio suffered from the ensuing economic decline caused by the war. Carmelita was born into a large, close, extended family. They were spread out across small ranchos of the area. Their relationships were strengthened by gatherings at celebrations, religious events, births, and deaths and at civic functions. Carmelita's mother, Lencha, was a kind religious woman. She herself came from a large family of eight children. Carmelita's father, Juan Guerrero, was a carpenter who had known Lencha since childhood. They were teenage sweethearts. They married in their early 20s. Within three years, the marriage ended with Juan's death. My mother recounts, in her own words. Once at a dance, my mother and father were having a good time dancing. Towards the end of the evening, when they sat down to rest, this woman came up and asked my father for a dance. He said no, and she walked away. But she came back later carrying a rose in her hand, and she said to my father, here, smell this. And she put the rose to his nose, Immediately, my father felt a sharp pain in his stomach. After that, he was in constant pain. The pain never went away. I do remember I used to hear him scream constantly with pain. Within a year, he died. His passing changed their lives significantly. Carmelita and her mother left the isolated rancho and moved to San Ignacio, where they settled in a small house across from the main plaza. Lencha opened a small grocery and dry goods store in their house. As a result, Carmelita grew up absorbing the comings and goings of people and her mother's effort to maintain a small business. Carmelita learned early the value of greeting and welcoming people, establishing important relations. She was a curious child, and the entire small town became her world, as well as the surrounding rural ranchos 
of their relatives' homes where she spent time. Print two, a new home. At the age of eight, Carmen's life would change even more dramatically. Her mother's oldest sister, Maria, who lived in the U.S. in San Francisco, came to visit Lencha in the summer of 1919. She invited Lencha to move to San Francisco. Maria argued that Lencha's life as a widow and a single mother would be better served in San Francisco. There, she would have opportunities for employment, schooling for Carmelita, a greater cultural experience for them both, and the possibility for remarriage. She added that Lencha and Carmelita could live with her until they got situated. Maria planned the trip for Lencha and returned to San Francisco that September. The following June, when Carmelita was eight years old, she and her mother made their way to Mazatlan and boarded the SS Alliance to sail to San Francisco. The Alliance was a cargo ship with accommodations for a few passengers. After a longer than expected trip and a near sinking scare, they arrived in San Francisco Bay in mid-July as evening was setting in. That night, from the Immigration Center, located on an island called Angel Island, they marveled at the thousands of distant lights in the surrounding shores and thanked God for their safe arrival. The next day, they boarded a ferry that transported them and other immigrants to the docks near the ferry building. Carmen and her mother would represent a small minority of Mexicans who came through Angel Island. Most crossed the border at El Paso, crossing on foot. At the Embarcadero, they took their fo first footsteps in the city. Over 50,000 people took ferries to the city each day. This was unlike anything they ever experienced. The sounds and sights coming at them was overwhelming. Horses clip-clopping, the creaking of wheels of wagons, dock workers shouting and pushing carts to and from the dock boats, streetcars clanging their bells, police whistles giving directions, horns honking from cars. It filled Carmelita with excitement. Florencia was quite shaken by it all. Carmelita could not help but stare at the women in long summer dresses with large hats, laughing and talking while fighting the windy July gusts. She took in the aromas from the coffee, candy, and bread factories lining the docks. As she thought of the whole experience, she knew this was all magical. For Carmelita, life would never be the same. She was completely captivated. She loved it. We left San Ignacio on horseback and then took a train to Mazatlan. There we got on a cargo ship bound for San Francisco. We stopped at many ports to load and unload. The minute the boat was docked near the ferry building, everyone was in a rush. I was excited about seeing all the movement. I held my mother's skirt. There was so much noise. All the lights in the city came on at once, all the way to the end of Market Street. What a welcoming. Life in San Francisco began. As planned, Carmelita and her mother moved into the home of her tia Maria. She was living in a three-story apartment house located on Pacific Avenue in the Russian Hill neighborhood on the edges of Chinatown in North Beach. They settled in, and although Carmelita was deeply excited and curious about their new life, her mother stayed nervous and hesitant. Within a short time, her mother found a job as a sewing machine operator at a factory making burlap bags. It was hard work, 
and the conditions were difficult. Fine dust flowed in the air, and Florencia daily ingested the material. Carmela's mother came home tired each night. Carmela initially attended a neighborhood school run by Catholic nuns. They mistakenly called her Camel rather than Carmela, and she became the bud of children's teasing. Her strong desire to learn helped her to become quite accomplished very quickly, including the learning of English. She showed curiosity, a strong work ethic, considerable artistic ability, and demonstrated great pride in her accomplishments. She would become an A student. As the months passed, Lencha gave serious thought to moving to her own place. Her sister's assistance was appreciated, but Maria's lifelong role as the oldest sibling giving direction and advice soon became tiresome. Lencha found a small apartment nearby. It was next door to Our Lady of Guadalupe Church, the spiritual center of the large Mexican colonia at the time. Carmen could not have foretold how much the church would be a constant part of her life. Broadway Street was the center of business for this diverse area. In addition to large numbers of Italians, the Latin Quarter, as this section is known, was well represented by Mexicans, South Americans, Spaniards, French, and Portuguese immigrants. Their apartment was adjacent to many of the Mexican restaurants, food stores, shops, and the Verdi, a movie theater showing silent films. It all provided Lencha and Carmelita with a sense of familiarity and warmth. Print three, an American family. Maria's prediction of remarriage for Lencia would soon become a reality. The neighbors were immigrants from Sicily. They owned a neighborhood variety store, and because Lencia became proficient at sewing, they offered her part-time employment as a seamstress. There was a need in the neighborhood for such a service, as many single Italian immigrant men needed alterations. Lencia took the job, adding evening hours to her work schedule. Carmela would keep her company at the store. Not long after, a good friend of the shop owners occasionally came in for sewing and alteration services. He was a cook in a local hotel. Antonio was his name, but he was known as Tony. At times, he would bring Lencia flowers, and before she knew it, Tony asked her to marry him. She initially ignored his flirtations. One Easter Sunday, he came to the shop. Marry me, he said to my mother. She said, no. Then he pulled a gun and said, if you don't marry me, I'll kill myself this minute. My mother married him. Eventually, my mother left my stepfather and soon he was in jail. He thought it was my Aunt Maria's fault that my mother left him. He chased her up a hill with a gun in his hand. We visited him in prison. The last time I saw him, he came across the whole prison yard on his knees to kiss my mother's hand. He committed suicide in prison by jumping from a second story balcony. From the marriage came two children. First was Caterina, or Katie, one year after that, Jose Luis, or Louis, was born. Now Carmen had the additional responsibility of caring for her siblings and guiding them as they grew. She loved them dearly and throughout her life, her sister and brother's well-being, as well as her mother's, would always be her concern. During the decade of their marriage, Tony and Lencia, with the financial help of Maria, purchased the store. 
they sold Mexican food products. During that time, they often moved both their home and business locations, but always within the Latin Quarter. Their store, La Mazatleca, grew and the workload expanded. The family and other workers were needed to keep the business running. As Carmen grew, she took on more responsibilities. She was the English-speaking representative for her family for business and other purposes. It was decided to buy Carmen a used Studebaker town car. There was a growing need for delivery of orders to customers and restaurants of tamales, enchiladas, and other prepared foods for dinners and parties. Carmen loved the freedom the car provided. She manipulated the oversized car around town facing the challenges of the steep hills of San Francisco. It also allowed her to take girlfriends to the city beaches or across the bay to Neptune Beach in Alameda or to the popular Marin Town and Country Club for its swimming pools, lawns, young people, and live music. Everything was wonderful in their expanding world. Over the years, Carmen and the family moved to various locations in the neighborhood. Circumstances caused the family to seek new places to live. First was Lencha and Tony's marriage, then the birth of Katie, followed by Louis's arrival. These moves around the neighborhood while giving Carmen, Katie, and Louis new and interesting perspectives were disruptive. Luckily, the neighborhood offered choices. The area had for decades been the destination for great migration to the city, adding movement and expansion within. New developing neighborhoods in the other parts of San Francisco offered North Beach residents new places to live. This gave Lencha and Tony opportunities to move with some frequency. The family's frequent moves also had the consequence of disrupting Carmen's schooling but she would persist and would eventually graduate from high school. This was a significant achievement. At that time, 60 to 70% of teens did not graduate. Unfortunately, on that occasion, there was an unpredictable disruption. Tony would not stay for the whole ceremony, causing the family to leave before she received her diploma on the stage. Carmen began to note the ugly side of Tony. Drinking would reveal his deep anger and darkness. His relationship with her and Lencha deteriorated. Carmen wondered if perhaps she was a reminder of her mother's first love, Juan. Tony became abusive to Louis, and only Katie could control him, offering him the sweetness he desired to calm him down. Eventually, Lencha asked him to move out. He did so. One evening, during a terrible argument Tony was having with Lencha, her sister Maria called the police. For Tony, this was the final straw. Shortly thereafter, he waited for Maria in front of a corner grocery store. When she showed, he threatened her. They argued. Frightened, she turned and ran, and he chased her. He pulled out his gun and shot at her as they ran up the street, the bullet entering the wall of a building. During the argument, the grocery store merchant had called the police. They arrived quickly and arrested him. A court trial was held, and he was convicted of attempted murder. While awaiting a transfer to San Quentin, the police reported he jumped from the walkway of the second tier of the cells and crushed his skull on the cement floor below. He died at San Francisco General Hospital. Once again, Florencia was a widow. Many months later, a former prisoner came to Lynch's home and told her he had witnessed a belligerent Tony thrown over the jail railing by the police. There was nothing she could do. The truth was never known. Print four, love and marriage.
At the threshold of adulthood, Carmen was engaging, curious, fearless, smart, charming, and accomplished. Her social life was active and growing. Her circle of friends grew unlike earlier in her life when her mother would not allow her to make many friendships. Carmen was yearning for a connection to the broader community. She got involved in church activities, tried acting and toured in the theater company. She joined her friends at social events and dances. She loved to dance. Dances required attention to dress and her appearance. According to her friends, she was always the first to be asked to dance. Young men were attracted to her outgoing personality and flair. She was cautious with men, resulting in a select few who she dated over time. I was very involved with Our Lady of Guadalupe Church. I was president of the Young Ladies Club and was in charge of the Women's Drama Club. At that time, Ignacio was president of the church's Young Men's Club. The two clubs would get together socially, such as dances and fairs. At that time, Nacho asked me to be seated in front of me at the dinner table. That night, he invited me to go to the movies with him. I do not know why, but I accepted. Nacho was nice looking. He had beautiful curly hair. He could not believe that I accepted. He had bet $5 with the priest who believed I would not accept since I was sitting next to my boyfriend. Nacho asked me in Spanish and my boyfriend could not understand Spanish. I'm surprised that I accepted. I think it was the wine. I really blame the wine. Harmon and Ignacio Carrillo began to date. Within a year, they were engaged, and a year later, they were married. It was a beautiful wedding at Our Lady Guadalupe Church. For their honeymoon, they borrowed a car and went off on a road trip to Santa Barbara and Los Angeles. Ignacio was handsome. He had arrived from Mexico in 1925 at the age of 15. He came with his father. Within the year, his father died and Ignacio was alone at 16. He continued to work. He had taken a job at the American Can Company and supported his family in Guadalajara. They were able to join him a year later. He was still there when he and Carmen married. In 1937, he and Carmen had their first child, a daughter, Beatriz. Carmen and Ignacio then went on to have children. Every two years, my sister, Carmelita, was born in 1939. A new decade was soon to be, and things were stable. Carmen was happy. In 1939, the Golden Gate International Exposition at Treasure Island opened. The exposition was an expression of San Francisco's enormous pride. The city had rebuilt itself following the devastating 1906 earthquake. The fair celebrated the construction of the world's two largest suspension bridges and was held on the world's largest man-made island. The city intended to highlight the economic and cultural importance and the achievements of nations touching the Pacific. At that time, Carmen, Carmen was working in an accounting firm. She had been taking night classes to learn more. The firm took on several accounts associated with the exposition. Carmen was offered the job of overseeing the bills of lading and sales receipts of the Mexican pavilion. The pavilion was one of several Central and South American pavilions located in the fair's Latin American court. But soon, she was assigned to manage the entire pavilion operations, including staffing and the sales room. 
Her Spanish was useful to the, de to the operations. Each day, she took a ferry from the Embarcadero to the island. The assignment fulfilled much of what she wanted in her professional life. Within the year, she would learn that everything would change dramatically, bringing some of the biggest challenges she would face. Print five, return to Mexico. I could say we had a good life until Nacho decided to go back to Mexico and start a business raising chickens. We left for Mexico in January 1941. I was pregnant with Juan Manuel. When I first saw Tamasula, my heart went down to the pit of my stomach. The house we lived in was pretty bad. We did not have running water. We had to buy the water we used for cooking and bathing. We had this crude toilet that led to a hole in the ground. The house had millions of cockroaches. The kitchen, you could not go in there at night for it was covered with them. I do not know how I was going to feed my family. I was very depressed that first year in Tamasula. I felt like killing myself. We had no money and a bleak future. The chicken farm business was a dismal failure. One day, Nacho went to feed the chickens and they were all dead. We do not know what happened. Later, when Nacho was a bracero in Idaho, he was not sending us money. And at that time, Nacho's brother was living at our house. He made my life hell. He would not go out and get a job. He just lay around all day. He came into my room one night while I was sleeping and he made advances. I disliked that man intensely even to this day. When the children and I left Damasula, it was near the end of November 1944. We took a bus from Tamasula to Mazatlan and a train to Nogales. When I saw the border and the American flag, it was the most wonderful feeling. When we arrived home, I was so happy. It was heaven. I was back with my family and in the city that I loved. My mother was crying and sobbing. I had my arms around her, hugging her. She was so happy. She would say, how beautiful are my grandchildren. These years for Carmen were perhaps the most difficult of her life. She did not want to move to Mexico. It was decided without her input. The idea of leaving her mother and siblings pained her. As she said, her first view of Tamasula made her heart drop. In those first days strolling through Tamasula, she compared what she left with what she saw. Of course, there was the town plaza, the church, so important to the town's needs, the mercado, nearly across from her home, the small shops and small eateries. She witnessed the Entrada de la Virgen del Sagrario, the special day when the long pilgrimage brings the statue of the Virgen to the church. She found her new home to be a major disappointment. When you add to that the long absence of Ignacio, the poverty, a terribly destructive earthquake, the lack of cultural institutions, the absence of her mother and siblings, and then the rape and pregnancy, it all seemed absolutely intolerable. She had spent the past 21 years growing up in a cosmopolitan, busy, crowded, growing city. San Francisco was proud of its commercial sector, its institutions, its parks, its waterfront, its theaters and nightclubs, and its beautiful vistas. On the other hand, she also later noted there were good memories, such as the birth of Juan Manuel and Maria Elena, the warmth and embrace 
of Ignacio's extended family and the wide circle of new friends. Ignacio's Tia Maria, I'm sorry, Tia Marta, was especially singled out. She was like a mother to Carmen. She took Carmen under her wing and made things so much better. Nacho left for Mexico City. With the dream of a successful chicken raising operation gone, Ignacio could not find work in Tamasula. He learned of the new U.S.-Mexico Bracero program to contract workers to fill in for the U.S. workers now fighting a war in Europe and in the Pacific. He was successful and was sent to the border to work somewhere in the U.S. He was assigned to work in Idaho, picking sugar beets and potatoes. As it turned out, it was a miserable experience. Meanwhile, Carmen was left with no husband and very little money. She tried many ways to earn an income, taking on various jobs. These jobs led to her meeting many people and slowly becoming part of life there. In time, she became part of the community, one that provided her with warm experiences that would last forever. But when Carmen had enough of the darkest part of her stay, she packed up the children and started her long trip back to San Francisco. She stopped first in Sinaloa to visit her uncle Canuto, then on to the border, pregnant and with four children. She was soon home with her mother, only to discover that Ignacio was there as well. In April 1945, the new infant baby, a boy, was born. From that day forward, the made-up story was that the child had been stillborn. In truth, he was given up for adoption. Carmen's children would never know him, and he was remembered as the brother who died at birth. Carmen forever suffered from the memory of it all. Time passed, and five years later, in 1950, Carmen's final child, the last of her angels, Ignatius, was born. 35 years later, I was to learn of the secret of the stillborn child and his adoption. It later slowly became known to others in the family that the baby was born live. It was through research and chance in 2018 that Carmen's sons, Juan Manuel and Nacho, eventually connected with the son of the adopted child. They learned their brother's name was Robert. Unfortunately, Robert had died the year before in 2017. We were to learn he had the spirit of an artist having explored his creativity as a sculptor, theater director, and a strong interest in media. Both he and Carmen had passed, and they would never meet. Print 6, La Presidenta. Carmen's marriage was challenged by her stay in Tamasula, but she had developed fortitude, resilience, and a life's commitment to her religion. Her love for her children was without question. They needed family, and she would not fail them. She symbolically took a deep breath and regained her balance, having learned from her life experiences and her vision for her own life. She made sure the children would get all they needed to succeed, religion, education, culture, and a strong extended family. Her home was served as a welcoming place for all. She was 33 years old and she felt as though her life was beginning again. Although leaving Mexico when she was eight, Carmen was always proud of her roots and heritage. She told her children, be proud of being Mexican. She would talk of the great civilizations of Mexico and its cultural heritage. 
When her children were grown and she nearing her retirement, she joined the Mexican Civic and Patriotic Committee, an organization that represented the Mexican people in San Francisco. Her membership offered her opportunities to make new friends and reconnect with people she had known for years. She showed great interest and strong commitment to the organization's work and, in time, became instrumental on its governing board. She rose to the ranks becoming Secretary General, then President of the Board. That position put her in direct contact with the city's mayor and other politicians. Mayors Joseph Valiodo, Diane Feinstein, and George Moscone became known to her. One annual responsibility as president was to issue a joint proclamation with the mayor and stand next to the mayor and the consul general outdoors on the steps of the city hall and offer a joint greeting and el grito to the assembled public gathered to celebrate Mexican Independence Day. I got involved with the Comité Mexicano Civico Patriotico. Several people invited me to join. I went and I liked it, so I stayed. I was the Secretary General of the Comité for a long time. Then they voted me president. This meant I represented the Mexican people of San Francisco to the public. As a result, I met many dignitaries, politicians, and celebrities. We raised money for earthquake victims in Mexico, sponsored cultural events, hosted visitors from Mexico, and celebrated the 16th of September from City Hall. I was friendly with the Consul General of Mexico, Pedro Vargas Jr. He invited us to his house for dinner several times. He came to our home several times. I was invited to go to Mexico with he and his wife. They took me to Frida Kahlo's house and Diego Rivera's museum. They had this terrific show to celebrate the 80th birthday of Pedro Vargas. They invited many dignitaries, even the president of Mexico. From the studio, we all went back to Pedro Vargas's house and we were sitting around this table, all these famous singers, El Puma, Jose Luis Rodriguez was sitting next to me. Vicky Carr was sitting across the table. Everybody sang except me. They wanted me to sing. How could I sing? The next day we were to have lunch with the president of Mexico, but I had to come home because I was supposed to be at work on Monday. Besides, Ignacio was expecting me. This was one isolated experience, one I will never have again. I've done things that other people only think about. And there was truth in that statement. She met and welcomed some of the great artists of Mexico, including Dolores del Rio, who was considered the epitome of Mexican beauty and was the first Mexican movie star to cross over into Hollywood films. Another time she welcomed actor and one of the top ranchera singers, David Saisal, to San Francisco for the occasion of Independence Day activities. It was a bit of irony that he and his family were born and raised in Tamazula. Her work led to some friendships she valued greatly, especially with Diane Feinstein. Carmen valued that friendship and their collaborations. She worked well with her committee members, attended to her assignments, and of course enjoyed the fun that came with their annual dinner and dance. The Comité membership appreciated her spirit and leadership. Print seven, stage and screen. My mother's work in stage, television, film, and advertising came late in life, or so we thought. I learned those roots came early. Our family photo collection included a young Carmen as a nun. It was odd to 
come across it. I had been educated by nuns throughout my childhood. So it was particularly odd to see your mother in full habit. I don't remember an explanation. But years later, as an adult, with my interest piqued, she explained it. She had played the role of Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, the most famous writer, philosopher, composer, and poet in 17th century colonial Mexico. Sor Juana joined the nunnery to fulfill her interest in roles not allowed to women at the time. Perhaps for Carmen, Sor Juana posed an early role model as a woman who went further than what others might expect. I started acting when I was a young girl with the Young Women's Club with Our Lady of Guadalupe Church. We used to do small plays to raise money for the church. There was this group that came to San Francisco from New York City to form an acting ensemble. They came to the store one day and asked me to join them. I accepted their offer. We traveled up and down the coast from Los Angeles to Sacramento doing plays. My Aunt Maria used to go with me. She used to love it. I was 18 years old and the youngest one in the group. I worked with the group for eight months. It was her experience with the Young Women's Club Theater that planted the seeds for her future. She had fun and the, and, and the performance required a skill set that challenged her. It was amateur theater, but it placed her in front of audiences and gave her the experience of being in the spotlight. Her early theater work was profound for her and her public presentation ability was fed by live theater. It all led her to excel in whatever public role she took on. She had a curiosity about film work. While visiting cousins in Los Angeles in the early 1930s, she was hired as an extra in a silent film directed by Cecil B. DeMille. We believe it to be The Sign of the Cross, released in 1932. In it, she was part of a crowd scene where Roman soldiers' force captured Christians up a stairway. The scene was shot repeatedly during the day. It was hot and exhausting work. She did not go back. In the actual film, the Christians are thrown in the arena with the lions. Carmen tells of later going to the movies to see if she could spot herself in the scene. She could not. In 1980, I was working with the Mexican Museum when a representative from Teatro Campesino came to invite me to be in a play at San Juan Bautista. When I went, I met Luis Valdez for the first time. I thought he was wonderful. I love working for the teatro, and I was a long way from home. It was wonderful being free like that. I was in four productions. I really liked acting. If it was possible and I was to do it all over again, I think I would have taken up acting as a serious profession. Following my mother's retirement, she began to expand her experience of representing Mexican culture on local television talk shows. She had been telecast on occasion explaining such things as the 16th of September, Cinco de Mayo, how to make Mexican paper flowers, or how to make the perfect tamal. Now she began to appear in advertising, in print media, billboards, or video. She took a major step and obtained an agent who looked for opportunities for her. It was also at this time she was recruited to join in productions of El Teatro Campesino. It was a professional company whose history grew out of the organizing of farm workers by Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, and Larry Itliong, and the strikes that followed. El Teatro Campesino brought to life the issues surrounding the workers. Founder and director Luis Valdez led the company on successful tours here in the U.S. and in Europe. 
Valdez wrote and directed the successful stage production of Zoot Suit. Later, he directed La Bamba. El Teatro's success led to establishing its own theater space in rural San Juan Bautista. In its inaugural year, Carmen performed in Soldier Boy. She had other small roles in the productions of Rose of the Rancho, La Pastorela, and Corridos. She greatly enjoyed getting to know the star, Linda Ronstadt. Of course, Carmen's roles were women of her age. I believe my mother had a problem acting her expected age because she carried herself with such energy and youthfulness in all her adult life that acting the roles written for a quieter and more sedentary person was not always easy. As to film, a bit part came in 1981 in the independent film Street Music. Later, she performed in the initial 1996 television series, Nash Bridges, with Don Johnson and Cheech Marin. Unfortunately, this most enjoyable part of her life ended that year when she suffered a severe stroke and was paralyzed at the age of 84. Print eight, Maria del Carmen. Carmen spent the last decade of her life in a wheelchair and needing assistance for her basic needs. Her ability to speak was difficult. Her demeanor changed, perhaps necessarily. She was more direct in her statements. Her smiles were less frequent. Her kindness and warmth diminished. Her engagement with the world seemed broken. But within her, her spirit was still larger than one might expect. Always wanting to paint, she, with the help of her artist daughter, Beatrice, began to learn the techniques. During this time, an organization named Artworks reached out to her. Artworks artists worked with homebound elderly patients, bringing to them a creative activities to help them overcome boredom, isolation, and physical deterioration. The artists worked together on exercises for voice, storytelling, poetry, and movement for disabled seniors. Carmen continually worked on overcoming her physical and emotional obstacles and produced some touching poetry and short stories at that time. These were placed in a binder for us to have. When my father died in 2001, I saw no reaction by my mother to his death. She seemed removed from it all. She continued to live in the house she loved alone with only the caretaker and visits and overnight stays by her daughters and sons to provide her company and comfort. She died in 2005 at the age of 92. In my research, I saw the great number of addresses in my mother's life. It is astounding to me I imagine her so many times packing suitcases, trunks, or boxes and loading them onto horses, trains, ships, and cars. There was little to no furniture being moved. It seems Carmen moved every one to three years in her young life. She moved from rancho to town, from town to big city, from one country to another, from apartment to apartment, from neighborhood to neighborhood. As I look back on the places where we kids lived, they were small apartments and flats, so often filled with relatives, friends, neighbors, co-workers, and others. Small, cramped, and fun. People came for short visits, celebrations, parties, sleepovers, and on a good number of occasions, our relatives from Mexico would stay with us until they were on their feet. Finally, after five grown children, Carmen 
would no longer need to move. She finally was able to purchase a home of her choosing in a neighborhood with lawns, trees, and silence at night. Having her own home added to her sense of completion. She had her own place to offer to family and friends. It fed her generous spirit. From that point forward, everyone would know Carmen's home. My relatives have said often, their memories of time spent there fed their own value for extended family bonds. I see my mother as an adventurous woman going where others in her world did not go. Her confidence grew as she discovered she could accomplish what others hesitated to try. She thrived in the limelight. She took it to represent to others a greater idea of herself and of her people. She had to be good. Being afraid to try was not in her makeup. She had her own image to live up to, something she took on as a young immigrant girl with practically nothing to her name. She was proud and expected the same from those around her. She passed on those values to us, her children. She taught us many things as her own mother did for her. In the last years of her life, Carmen composed a poem to her mother, Florencia. The poem says much about the spirit to survive and to accomplish, passed from mother to child. My mother's spirit has now been passed on to us. Perhaps you might think about the origin of your own spirit. In praise of my mother. In praise of my mother. You had such beautiful skin, a very sweet face, brown eyes, clear like water with gold specks. I could see deep into them. Everyone loved you. You were the most friendly person. Get on a streetcar, and by the time you got off, you had everyone's phone number, and they had yours. Are you sorry you came here? Where is our trunk filled with the past life in Mexico? Pictures of my father and my dolls. We arrived safely with nothing. Mama, I thank you for all your efforts to educate me. You believed that one person could make a difference, that I could be another George Washington. You believed strongly in the United States. You loved it so much. Yet you cried, stamped your feet. You hated to go to work. Tia Maria made you lunch, and every day I watched you throw it in the trash as you walked to the sack factory. You worked hard for all of us. You wanted us to be honored and respected by people. Have I lived up to your expectations? I've tried. I'm still trying. Thank you for your love, your faith in us. You left your home, your family, your friends, your country, all the dear, familiar things for my sake to give me a better life. I was too young to understand, but now that I am old, I recognize your sacrifice. Tell me, Mama, are you happy now? And that ends the words. You've seen the art. Uh, and I hope there was something there for you. Uh, it um, it means a lot to me, for sure. Uh, thank you very much. I, I do want to say some other things. Um, uh, one is uh, how these were made. Um, I'm going to show you some, some images, very few. But I wanted you to have this background. Uh, when I began to make these, my mother had already passed, and I wanted to do something for her. And I, so I thought, well, print. Well, I'll need a few prints. Oh, I'll need some more prints. And it went to eight prints, and uh, in the uh, in the suite, uh, it took me a few years to complete it. Uh, I was uh, lucky, fortunate enough to. Uh, to have a, a good friend who is a master at printing, Malakias Montoya. 
and he helped guide me through this process. Uh, oftentimes, he even put his muscle into it. He was screening the prints. Uh, he was just good to have at my side, you know, the, the guardian angel that sits on your shoulder. Uh, I would say that uh, Malachias was my guardian angel in the process. Malachias is the founder of a of, of a operation and organization uh, that we all, all call Tana, Taer Arte del Nuevo Amanecer, and through his efforts, uh, UC Davis. He was a, a faculty member, professor at UC Davis, and with uh, his and other efforts uh, in place. A site in Woodland was established, an arts center, where silk screening would be taught to youth and community members. And uh, so this is the location in Woodland. This is the interior. It's a wonderful space, continuing exhibitions. The teaching goes on here. And so uh, more generations of people are being taught this art form by uh, by the, the folks there. Uh, Malakias is now retired, and Jose Arenas is the director, and with others under his uh, his uh, leadership, uh, the, the work continues. I have a couple of images. They won't tell you much, but it sort of proves that uh, I was there. What's the next? Yeah. Well, this is Malakias uh, working on my print. Well, I sat down, had a beer and a cigar, just joking. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, he gets his hands in it. And the last print is, uh, I believe it's the last print coming up. Uh, yeah, me holding up his work. No, I'm kidding. He, me holding up our work. I'll put it that way. This is the love and marriage print that uh, we printed there. And... Uh, I guess that's it. Uh, I met Malakias way back when I was a Berkeley student. He was a Berkeley student. I came to Sacramento and to get my master's degree. And as you heard, I taught at Kasumnes River College. And as you also had heard earlier, I was a member of the Royal G I am a member of the Royal Chicano Air Force. It's um, a circle. It started as a circle of artists. And then it became a circle of artists, educators, a circle of artists, educators, and other people in the community. And it grew to be a very large circle that did a lot of things here in Sacramento. And so when I think of RCAF, I think of a community of people, multi-generational, and I fully expect that that uh, circle will continue to be in place even though many of us are gone, the, the children, the grandchildren, uh, other community members, students who have uh, had their experience in community work and uh, political work, um, who believe in things like justice, um, are part of the circle. But if we all care about the community. So I guess now, we uh, turn it over to questions, answers, and comments, and I look forward to any exchange. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juan. Um, that was such a moving presentation. I have to say that you are such a great storyteller. Um, at times, it felt like I was watching a documentary and it, not a Zoom webinar. So that was a truly a unique experience and so well done. Um, so I wanted to tell you that. And now well, let's open it up for sure. yeah, okay. you're welcome. let's open it up for questions from the audience. So again, if you have any questions, type them into the QA feature. And uh Melissa, what questions do we have so far? Got quite a few questions already. So the first one is uh did your mother cultivate your love of the arts? My mother cultivated my what? Your love of the arts. Well, you know, it's like um, you stand next to something that has great fragrance and uh, you walk away with some fragrance. 
I'm sure that I have had that. Um, my mother had no training in art. She did not make art. Um, she uh, probably the best thing my mother could do was dance. If she were a dancer, she would have been uh, a good dancer. And I pride myself on my, well, I used to be much better on my dance steps. But my love of history is, uh, I think, related to my mother's persistent uh, efforts to not only appreciate my history, um, but to go to school, to get an education. She wanted me to be an engineer and for no good reason, except she worked for an engineering company, PG&E. But uh, uh, certainly that uh, she wouldn't let me join the military when I wanted to quit high school. Uh, because that's where my mind was at the time. Quit with my friends, and we all joined the military as a group. And she would not sign the form because she said, you haven't graduated. When you graduate, I'll sign the form. Well, um, I did join the military, and that's the Royal Chicano Air Force. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I would say that um, there, there was piano in the house. I tried violin. Uh, I tried accordion. Nothing, nothing worked. Um, it became the visual art. I've always drawn cartooning. And so the roots are uh, cartooning for me. Okay, so the next question is, why oh, we have did... Oh, we've got, we've got quite a few questions. Oh, okay. So um, why did... Why did Juan's father move back to Mexico? Was it because he was very young? Well, he, he I believe the story is he was pulled with his father to come. He was 15 years old. He's in that dangerous age that all of us are at 15. You know, you're just sort of trying this, trying that. My father got involved with a movement called the Cristero movement in his teens. The Cristeros were fighting back on the side of the church against the revolution because the revolution was making profound changes in the role of the church in Mexican society. So my grandfather, his father, had been um, the town mayor, Tamasula. Uh, I'll say mayor. They had different uh, name for that. But... Uh, and I believe he was on the side of the revolution, the rebels. And by virtue of that, he was able to uh, have a government position like this. I don't think he was comfortable with his son joining the conservative, the other side. And so um, at 15, it's really time to give thought to work. Uh, and so he took him with him to the United States. My father always missed Mexico. He was a Spanish speaker in an English-speaking society. He had trouble with language and with English. Uh, he, he tried. He made his way through. But he uh, had some dismay that we were growing up English-speaking kids in the house, not Spanish. Uh, and uh, I just think he had some really wonderful memories of Mexico when he was a boy and he wanted to go back. But he was not going back as a boy. It was going back to something that was no longer there. It had been from age 15 until he went back. I guess it must have been almost 30 years that passed. And um, things change. So the next question is, what made you decide to create prints? artworks from your mom's life story instead of a book or a poem? Uh, who says I haven't written a book or a poem? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, that's a real neighbor to what I just completed, which it felt like, I, I called it a script for this presentation. I wrote this script uh, and uh, script writing, I don't recommend it folks. It's it's tough. Uh, I found it tough, but I I do enjoy writing. I don't know what will come, um, and there may be a poem uh, 
for my mother. I, I may have even written something, and I just don't remember the poem. Um, this was just a choice. I mean, there was uh, Tana is there, that uh, they were very open to artists coming. I come from a group that is known for its prints. I've printed in the past. Um, I'm uh, pleased to say that the, the library here, the state library, has some prints of the RCAF, and mine included. Um, uh, I liked what I did in prints. I'm, it's just a technique I've not mastered, and so it's always a challenge to relearn because it's so rare to relearn. But in this case, I dove in and it became a bigger job, just like the script that I just finished, a bigger job than I thought going in. Uh, but it, and it took years, but it, it was just a choice one makes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the next question, they said, beautiful, multi-layered story. How do you feel about Tamasula today? And then they have a follow-up question. How can someone purchase a book? Well, I was just in Tamasula um, just over a month ago. Hmm. I, I visited Tamasula for the first time in my life after I left when I was three and a half. The first time uh, I was 26 years old when I returned. Uh, and I was a uh, I was a young man. I was a Berkeley student at the time. I wanted to know more about my uh, myself, my roots, uh, where I came from. I wanted to know my family who lived in Mexico. And so, luckily, I had ten weeks called a quarter at, at Berkeley. We jumped. My wife and my son, my two year old son, jumped in the car, Volkswagen Bug. And we drove for almost 10 weeks all over, um, had an incredible time. So I was introduced to Tamasula at that time. <laughs> we drove into Tamasula. I did not know it. The power had gone out in town. And there was kerosene lamps hanging in the houses everywhere we went. The streets are dark, the houses lit. And I went, oh, my God. I mean, lamps? <laughs> yeah, this is 1967, sort of what my mother went through when she arrived. You know, I just went, right. "What? Where am I?" Uh, and then the next day there was power, but uh, I just and I've been there several times with different family members, and I was just there with my son, the last son, uh, who had never been to Tamasula. Now he's 38, maybe. He asked me to go with him. I said, sure, let's go. Messing up, I won't tell you all that. But we ended up in Damasula one night during their annual feria with the fireworks mm -hmm. and the Entrada de, las, de la Virgen. We witnessed that. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the best nights I've ever had in Mexico. And then I went to Guadalajara and my other son joined me. Uh, one other son of my four that uh, are living. And he joined me, and we had a fantastic time. Found one of the 50 greatest bars. We uh, we ate wonderfully. We played music real loud in a penthouse that we rented. We drank. We <laughs> insulted each other and laughed like mad. It was wonderful. So I recommend it. <laughs> que viva Tamasula. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and the next question is, um, what is, this is a good one, what is one piece of advice you offer people documenting their family stories? Well, I, I said it early. My advice is talk to your family. Sit down, record, whether it's written or whether it's uh, with a sound record, record their stories. Do it. Otherwise, it gets too late. Yeah. I mean, there are mysteries I will never know. There are questions that we have that will never be answered because that generation is gone. This last weekend, my my tia Lupe died. Oh, I'm sorry. This is my, my thanks. 
this is my uh, my father's generation. Yeah. She was the last living person of that generation in our direct line, uh, my on paternal side. Uh, and, uh, you know, her stories, who will ever know? Right. All right. So let's see. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Okay. Um, so I'm just going in order as they were received. We have many more questions to go, but we're running short on time. Um, so let's see. Uh, the next one was, uh, since your poetry echoes your mother's, was she your first poetic inspiration? Was, uh, re was the first part. Repeat. Oh, since your poetry echoes your mother's, was she your first poetic inspiration? The death of Lencha. Hmm. My mama Lencha. Yeah, I mean, it's... it's uh, I went into a room and I wrote a long poem and I'd never written a poem in my life. Oh, wow. And uh, it, it was, she died on the day of my son's first birthday, hmm. August 3rd, 1970. And we had a birthday party planned for this one year old. And uh, that morning, uh, Mama Lynch died and we talked, siblings. Are we going ahead with this party? You know, the little kids coming and we're celebrating and ha ha ha, blow the candles out. And are we really going to do this? And it was decided, hey, these are children. Come on. It's their day. Mm -hmm. And we went forward. But that night I wrote the poem. Um, um, yeah, that's my first inspiration. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I think we've got time for one more. So let me one more. One more question. Um, let's see. And then we will um save the other questions, the remaining ones, and, and share them with you after, just so you can see what people were curious about. Um let's see. Your mother evolved continuously. Are there things you see yourself evolving into also that are new lately? That are what? That are new. Yes, of course. <laughs> I mean, let's hope we are all doing that, that we're yeah. continually evolving and growing and learning and being surprised. You know, I love it. I love it. I it's, in some ways, maybe that's the spirit of my mother, that uh, me behaving my age, 84, I mean, 82, uh, I'm 82, and I sometimes have to say to myself, you know, you're acting like you're not 82. Well, I am 82, and I'm not acting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's... Uh, I think I'm answering that question. I don't even know. I just it had to do with evolving or yeah, just that your mom just it was very evident that she was always evolving and always kind of growing and and really active. And so they're just curious if there's anything you've been doing lately that's new that you feel um, that's in that spirit. Well, it's certainly in the arts. You know, yeah. the the idea the idea of creating is. Um, is can be exhilarating it can be challenging it can be daunting it can it can you can lose in the process uh it didn't work it's terrible i hate it uh gee i wish i had more of uh, talent insight spontaneity uh uh whatever the other thing is the grace that comes to all of us in those moments when we uh, when we are truly unique, uh, creating something, uh, yeah, yeah I, I wish there was more of that. I, I look forward to it happening. I don't want it to stop, like my yeah. mom starting to paint. You know, she's uh, she shouldn't even be trying that in most cases, right? Mm -hmm. I don't mean she shouldn't be. I'm saying that the the common thing would 
Yeah, Carmen, let it go. Enough. You've done it all. <laughs> Just relax. Enjoy your life. Sit in a chair and watch television for the next 10 years. Come on. No. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah. So there's so many more questions. We will share them with you. So sorry, everyone, we thank couldn't get to all of them. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for sharing your story and your mom's story. It was, it was really beautiful. Thank yeah. you, Melissa. And before we wrap up, uh, I wanted to let our audience know that if they're interested in seeing any of the prints from tonight's talk, Everyone is welcome to make an appointment to view them in person. Also, Juan has graciously given permission to make low res scans available. So we're working on uploading them to our digital library. But in the meantime, you can email us at cslcal at library.ca.gov. And um, I just want to say for me personally that I, I love how these prints serve as a, a wonderful example of how someone can preserve their family history instead of going the traditional route of publishing a book. So hopefully that inspired other folks too who are embarking on their own family history research or preservation. Um, and you could do it through art like Juan has. And um, just a quick reminder uh, that when you leave this webinar today, a survey will pop up in the browser. So please fill that out if you can. We'll also email it to you. It's a short survey that should only take a few minutes of your time. Thank you again to Juan and a special thank yeah. you to your nephew, Julian. And I say, well, yeah, yeah, Julian. I, Julian. Who is not on camera here, but I, I do want to also make an announcement on behalf of the library. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. And that is there's currently some RCAF prints that are on display here at the State Library. You should come take a look if you're so interested. And there have been two RCAF presentations done in the past, these Zoom uh, video casts, that you should log on to the uh, the library uh, website and you can view Juanishi and I, and the other was Rudy and Louis uh, the Foot, Rudy Cuellar and uh, Louis Gonzalez. Um, and so uh, with Tere Romo yeah, yeah. Uh, on that, anyway, just want the people to hear. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Juan. Yes. Yes. People are welcome to uh, see that exhibit uh, eight to uh, eight to four or eight to five, excuse me, in the Rotunda 900 End Street. Um, and we can send links out in the emails that follow. But uh, yes, those recordings are up on the YouTube channel. Um, all right. Thank you again, Juan and Julian. And we hope to see everybody at our next event in June. Have a great night, everybody. Bye.